Uh, our speaker, uh, Vanna Nashiva, is an ecofeminist from with a PhD in nuclear physics. How's that? Uh, she is an author of over 500 professional articles, uh, over 20 books, including Staying Alive, Women, Ecology, and Survival in India, Stolen Harvest, Hijacking the Global Food Supply, and Soil Not Oil. There are many books that she that you may have read relating to her, and that's probably why you're so excited about seeing her. She is the, also the winner of a, a number of awards, including the Wright Livelihood Award, which is sometimes described as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize, and many other awards from the United Nations and other, other locations, including the Sydney Peace Prize just this last November in Sydney, Australia. She is active with organizations including the Indian People's Campaign Against WTO, the International Forum on Globalization, and NAVDANA, which is a movement in India seeking to protect biodiversity and food sources while promoting organic farming and fair trade. I could go on and on, but I'm not, because you're here to listen to Vandana Shiva, and I hope you can join me now in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be able to come to your college. Be closer, okay? Uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you um, and share some of my thoughts, both about what globalization has done to our societies, as well as alternatives that we can imagine and build. And of course, the alternative I propose is Earth democracy. And for me, Earth democracy is both a widening of democracy to include all beings on Earth. And that's not a very strange idea, actually. Most ancient cultures have thought that way. My own society in India talked of Vasudheva Kutumbakam. Vasundhara is the earth, the divine sacred earth. Vasudhev is of the earth. Kutumbakam is the family of the earth. And in the earth family are all beings, and not just all living beings in terms of biological beings. In India, we treat mountains as beings, so we have sacred mountains. We've just succeeded in uh, stopping the mining of bauxite in um, a, a mountain in Orissa called Niam Giri. Niam stands for law. Giri means the mountain that upholds the universal law. And the ancient, ancient tribe of the Dongri Akond that inhabits this mountain has been fighting one of the biggest aluminium companies of the world that wanted to mine the bauxite. And they invited me down and I did a lot of mobilization with them. And finally, last August, the government announced that that mining, which had been approved all the way to the environment ministry, the approval was withdrawn. So even today, there are communities that think of us as part of the earth. The First Nations, we have just done a food justice conference where the First Nations presented uh, a session on first foods. And uh, it was all about sacred food. It was all about the fact that food makes us, we make food, and it's all part of the web of life. Somewhere along the way, partly because of the way the worldview of the West changed. Uh, and I, you know, I, I interact a lot with, for example, the Orthodox Christian Church, where the patriarch talks about the Earth family. He talks about pollution as sin. So there's, 
Even in Christianity, it is possible to talk about us being part of the earth. But of course, there is, there's been mutations in Christian thought. Mutations that threw out Mary, you know? There was actually a papal order that said, remove all the images of Mary. Because when I go to Florence, I advise the region of Tuscany and chair a commission on the future of food that they have created. And they take me to the museums, you know, these ancient museums of the Renaissance. And Christianity is only Mary. All the images are Mary, all the paintings are Mary, all the sculptures are Mary. And there's one David. And I love that. Um, the changes that took place started to think of, of the empire of man over inferior creatures. That's the language that was used during colonialism. That's the language that was used when the occupation of this land was being done and land was being taken away from the first people. And what we got then was a way of thinking about ourselves, which is called anthropomorphism. You know, everything human-centered, other beings don't count. And in that process, we still try to define freedom for ourselves. And that freedom was named democracy. And it was described as being of the people, for the people, by the people. And something changed. Of course, the seeds of that change had been sown for colonialism. Um, the first company that was ever a corporation that was incorporated was called the East India Company, 1600. And the main job was go out and conquer India, Indonesia, wherever there were spices. Even poor Columbus was setting out for India to get our spices. And uh, he thought he landed in India, and so he called the Native Americans Indians forever. And so they're called Indians. I call it Columbus, Columbus's big blunder. Um, but as all blunders do, they have some externality, and I love the fact that the Native Americans are called Indians. I'd love the whole world to be Indian. <laughs> Indian more in terms of this very generous worldview that has kept a civilization going. In India, China are the two oldest civilizations in continuity. We've had other civilizations, but they went under, largely because of the exploitation of the earth. And we thought, and I still do, we believe that you are more civilized in direct proportion to how little you plunder the earth. Whereas anthropomorphism gave us a measure of progress that the more you can destroy the earth, the more progressive you are, the more advanced you are. Well, the next mutation that took place, even though the corporation was created in 1600, it was still, you know, after decolonization, after our freedom movements, 1857, we threw the East India Company out. We had a very, very big revolution. And then the British crown took over, but his East India Company had, went. And some Indian firm has just bought up the old East India Company, um, just the name. It's really globalization of today's period, because in a way, one could think of colonization as globalization of an earlier period. Today's globalization changed our perception of the world one step more. So we went from the earth family to the human family with only human beings as beings. And now we have this strange situation where even human beings don't count and the only being is the corporation. So if you look at your recent Supreme Court decision, which basically said corporations can influence democracy as much as they want by paying any amount to influence electoral processes, and that is their freedom of speech. Business corruption of politics has been defined as the freedom of speech 
of a legal fiction, the corporation, because it only exists on a piece of paper that says this corporation is now given legal personality, and the legal personality is of personhood. It is treated as a person. But when a corporation is treated as a person, and it is then given rights, and the WTO really is the constitution of corporate rights, what you basically get is movement from anthropomorphism to what I would call corporatism, where only corporations have rights. Now, democracy used to be of the people, by the people, for the people. They call it free market democracy now, which means the rule of the corporation. And that is of the corporation, for the corporation, by the corporation. And you know, I'm trained as a physicist. I'm not used to using English frivolously. I'm very prudent about my use of English. And so when I use strong words, it's because that is the reality that we are in. We are in the reality of corporate rule. If you look at the treaties of the WTO, you know, we've had trade before. I mentioned Columbus. Why was he sailing to India? Because India was exporting pepper. So we've had trade before WTO. Trade is not new. What's new is that now there is an international legally binding agreement, which was never an agreement. Nobody agreed to it. It was imposed on the world. And the main elements of this that take us beyond traditional international trade are elements that are what I would call elements of invasion into citizen rights. They're not about trade. So we normally think of globalization as a geographic spread. And many people write about how the world is becoming one village. No, the world is becoming a global supermarket, not a village. But in the process of the world becoming one global supermarket, what we really see is a vertical shift, not just a horizontal shift of everyone being brought into one global marketplace, but a vertical shift of power and control moving into the hands of corporations. And this was in the design of the WTO, who wrote that terrible treaty called Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement. What a mouthful. Now, I'm sure you don't understand what it means, and she shouldn't, because every word of it is fabricated with a purpose. Intellectual property never existed before. We had industrial property, patents. All the machinery on this desk has a patent behind it, this screen, this telephone, this mic. Um, and nobody rebelled. Nobody said, why should a mic be patented? Because it's either one country or company or the next company that will make these gadgets. And patents were about excluding competitors from uh, benefiting from an innovation. But in the WTO, the Intellectual Property Rights Agreement has not just allowed but forced countries to start patenting life and patenting seed. Life is not in invention. Seed is not created by Monsanto. All that Monsanto does is put toxic genes into a seed. Now for that, I don't think they should be rewarded with a property right. They should be punished for poisoning our food. And I, I was very fortunate to be invited to a very early meeting in 1987 where the biotech industry was planning the future. There were no GM crops at that time, but they were thinking of it. And they said, we have to do genetic engineering in order to take patents. And to do all this, we need an international treaty to force on the world. So the forcing of GMOs and the forcing on patents was made possible by the WTO. And in 95, when the WTO was created, a representative of Monsanto 
which had been part of a core group of companies that wrote this treaty, they said, we've achieved something unprecedented in the history of industry and commerce. We defined a problem, and the problem they defined was that farmers save seeds. It's like defining a problem that people eat food. <laughs> yeah. And they said, we'll find a solution. We offered the solution, and the solution was it should be turned into a crime. Seed saving should be turned into a crime. And we were the patient, the diagnostician, and the physician all in one. Isn't that dictatorship? So I thought of this as seed dictatorship. And after this meeting, we were having a press conference. And during the press conference, a journalist asked, so how do you deal with this kind of power, with this kind of dictatorship? And I just froze, because I didn't know how to deal with it. But I had a flight back to India. And that's a long flight, eight hours of thinking. And during this freeze, I turned to Gandhi. Now, you might remember that when British, the British ruled the world, they controlled 85% territories of the entire planet. And the colonization of that time had taken place around controlling cloth and textiles. The first industrialization took place around mechanized weaving. Some of you are standing at the back. There are lots of seats. So, and you know, to achieve that, people always think it's the machines that generated all this wealth. No, it's slavery that generated the wealth. Africans had to be captured and brought to do cotton picking. India had to be forced to grow indigo rather than food. And you know the blues I'm wearing, these indigo colors? They used to come only from a natural dye. And first in Bengal, then Bihar, the, at, at that time the East India Company would force, initially the East India Company and then the British, would force India to plant indigo while people starved. Gandhi was invited to this area when he returned from South Africa. And um, the person who became our first president was from these areas, and he had called Gandhi. His name was Rajendra Prasad. And um, so Gandhi went house to house, hut to hut. And he went to one hut, and he asked this woman, are you the only one? And she says, no, my mother-in-law is inside. Uh, he says, call her out. And she said, I can't bring her out because we only have one sari, this six yards of cloth we call the sari. We only have one sari between us. And she can only come out and meet you when I go in and she takes the sari. And that's what broke Gandhi's heart. And he said, these are the people who are running the textile empire, whose labor is creating the wealth in the textile empire. They can't have clothing, and they are starving. And then he created this mobilization, which is in our part of the world famous as the Indigo Satyagraha. Now, the word Satyagraha, in my heart, is such an important word. Satyagraha means the fight for truth. Satya is truth. Agra is the force, the fight from truth. And uh, he had actually practiced the first Satyagraha in South Africa. I was in room, um, in room number 911 at Heathman Hotel. And Margaret Halleck, who's really responsible for my being here, she said, oh my god, you're in 911. I said, doesn't bother me, because there's another 911. <laughs> and that older 911, 1901, is the day Gandhi told the apartheid rulers, along with other Indians, we will not wear the identity badges that divide us as citizens. Because the apartheid regime obviously wanted to divide the blacks and the Indians and the whites. That's what its entire philosophy was based on. And he said, we are one e citizen, set of citizens. We are equal. You might also remember he had been thrown out of a train 
because he was a lawyer, and as a lawyer, he was paid a first-class fare. But because he was an Indian, the racists threw him out. He stayed on in South Africa, mobilized, and then eventually created a garden and a farm called the Phoenix Farm. Phoenix, of course, means to rise again. But his first satyagraha was South Africa. His second satyagraha was the Indigo Satyagraha. And then he went on to do the salt satyagraha, where when the British forced us to stop making salt, he said, we'll continue to make our salt. Um, but there was another part of Gandhi that is the part that inspired me. And when I was thinking of the dictatorship, I said, you know, Gandhi pulled out a spinning wheel and started to spin cloth in the face of the empire. And everyone laughed and said, how do you think some little pieces of wood can bring you freedom? Because everyone thought, if you've got cannons, you've got to shoot back. That violence is the response to violence. And Gandhi said, this is the only thing that can bring us freedom because it is so small and it is so humble that it can be in the hands of the last person this hand-spun, hand-woven cloth, which we call khadi, can be in every hut, the poorest of huts, and the poorest and most marginalized of Indians can become a freedom fighter. And that's exactly what happened. Indians started to spin their own cloth. People had a boycott of British clothing. And the beauty about doing these small things is it gives you a sense of power. It's an education in re discovering how powerful you can be. Because when you, all you do is look at the mills in Lanc uh, Lan Lancashire and Ma Manchester, you feel powerless. They're far, you can't influence them. What do you do? You start spinning your cloth. My God, those mills are irrelevant to my life. And I can generate my own freedom. So I started to think, and as a physicist, I did a little matrix. First industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, third industrial revolution, textiles, chemicals, life. And I said, if the third industrial revolution is about the industrialization of life through genetic engineering and biotechnology, then the spinning wheel of our times is the seed. And so I got off the plane. I was doing lots of work. I was working on the Narmada. I was working on the Bhopal rehabilitation. And I told colleagues in Bhopal Narmada, I said, you look after all this. Now I'm just going to save seeds. And I pulled every book I could find in my parents' library and trotted off to the villages where I had been involved with another very important Gandhian movement during my college days at the age where you are. And that movement was called Chipko which means to embrace. Women of my region came out in the early 70s to stop logging and deforestation. And they said, before you kill the tree, you'll have to kill us. We'll embrace the trees. And it took a decade, but by 1981, we got a logging ban. There's no deforestation, no cutting of trees commercially allowed anymore in my part of the Himalaya where the Ganges and the Yamuna rivers rise. And it was, you know, peasant women who led this movement, who imagined the movement, who found the solution, again through nonviolence. And it was a very Gandhian movement. So I went back to these villages where I had worked as a volunteer and started to ask women, do you have these seeds? Do you have this seed? Do you have this seed? Do you have this, this seed? And um, I must tell you a side anecdote, uh, two little anecdotes. Um, the women would giggle and say, you know, we have we have the millets, which are dark. You know, the millets are always dark, the finger millet, the um, uh, barnyard millet, seven kinds of millets. And the reason they're called millets is because each seed in a millet gives rise to a million seeds. The millet comes from millions. But of course, again, because we had racism, we had racism in food and all the dark foods were defined as inferior crops. They were literally were called inferior crops, as if they were a secondary race, because they were colored. And the women would giggle and say, you know, we've kept growing them because we know they're nutritious. 
And the men think the rice is the more privileged crop. And they eat the rice and they can't do any work. And we eat the millets and we can climb the mountains and take 40 kilograms on our backs. So I started to save millets. We call them forgotten foods, foods humanity has stopped eating. And these are the future foods. This year, in fact, is dedicated for us to these for forgotten foods as future foods. They could be wild foods, they could be unharvest, you know, uncultivated foods, but the millets are my absolute favorite. They had 40 times more nutrition, use one-tenth the water that in industrial farming does, and are so resilient that any kind of climate change they can deal with. The other anecdote is equally funny because uh, of course, I, you know, the books were in English. And uh, as Indians, we eat a lot of dals, the pulses. Yeah. Um, normally, you only think in terms of lentils, but we eat urad, arhar, moong, gehet. Now, we have Indian names for all of this. But when I looked at the English names, I couldn't believe it. They were chickpea. Pigeon pea, cow pea, horse gram. And the problem had been the British didn't know what to do with this. So they just fed all these crops to animals and named it as cattle feed, even though they are most important for our nutrition because for vegetarians, they are the only source of protein. And then the Green Revolution wiped them out further. And now we have such huge pulse scarcity because these are nitrogen-fixing crops. We have such huge pulse scarcity that first, the US is fine subsidizing the production, but they can't get it right because, you know, for, for them, they're just selling a commodity. And they sell us something called the yellow pea dal, which makes no sense because either it's a pea or it's a dal. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of just, you know, hotista stuff, and, and the only time I eat it is really if I'm on a flight and they serve it. Totally tasteless. But they, one step further, because the price rise, you know, food prices are just keep rising. And in India, they haven't come down since 2008. And the price of pulses has gone up very high. Last year, the Arhardal, which the British named pigeon pea, is price rose to 150 rupees a kilogram. So the government used this as an opportunity to do something that the soya industry has been wanting to do for very long. They introduced something for the, called the ai dal. Now, why would you think a dal is called an ai dal? I, all I can think of is, you know, everything is sold to us in the name of technology. And these days, high tech is iPad, iPhone, i whatever. And they thought put i before dal and You've, you'll have everyone eating it. And these poor women who couldn't afford the 150 dal weren't buying this 25 rupee dal. And when they were asked, why aren't you buying it? They said, it's not a dal. It has no taste. It has no uh, flavor. If we, want, if we eat dal, we want it for the taste it brings to us. Guess what this ai dal is? Soya flour extruded into the shape of a dal and dyed yellow. And they actually have this program called analog dals, where they will cook up. These are not just false food. The other day at the University of Oregon, I said what, what the corporations have done is turn seed into anti-seed. Seed is supposed to give forth life. If you have a terminator seed, you made it the opposite of what a seed should be. Seeds multiply when you force farmers to not be able to save seeds and not multiply their seeds. You have, again, made the seed the opposite of what it should be, and I call that anti-seed. Monsanto is not selling seed, it's selling anti-seed. And in the same way, the agribusiness is not selling food, they're selling anti-food. It's anti-food both in the sense that it's harming the earth. Food is supposed to nourish the earth. You grow a crop, you put some of it back into the earth as organic matter. Forever you can get food. 
There's no reason you should ever run out of nutrients because the very production of food is the production of nutrients. Now, you get the opposite. Agriculture has become, become a soil depletion process. You are not just taking away from the earth, you're taking away from the farmer, a food producer. For in India, in Sanskrit, we call food anna, A-N-N-A. And the farmer is the anna devata, he's the one who gives us the food. He, she gives us the food. Today, the farmers are in debt, losing their land, and that's universal across the world. But in India, because this was pushed so violently on a peasant society, on an agrarian culture, you know, we are 1.2 billion people, of which 70% are still on the land. And overnight, corporate power tried to push GM seeds, uh, trade in commodities, the WTO rules of um, agriculture were written by Cargill, just like the rules of patenting on seed were written by Monsanto. So I call one a Monsanto treaty, I call the other a Cargill treaty. And the first cases in WTO, because WTO is both a court, it's a treaty making place, like we elect legislators to write law, they're lawmakers, the WTO writes the laws, or the corporations write the laws for the WTO. And then it's the executive, it implements the decision. So it's all in one, totally dictatorial body. So if Monsanto was the diagnostician, the physician, all in one, the WTO is the executive, the courts, and the parliament, all in one. And the first cases against in, in WTO were all brought against India. One, that we should change our patent laws to allow patenting of seed and patenting of medicines. And the second, that we should allow the dumping of artificially subsidized food. So, of course, I had started Navdanya in 1987. Navdanya means the nine seeds. It also means the new gift. The nine seeds are diversity, the new gift is reclaiming our commons. And the beginning of Navdanya really was again inspired by, on the one hand, the spinning wheel, so we call it seed sovereignty, Bij Swaraj, Gandhi's concept of Swaraj. And we started with the concept of Satyagraha, that we will not recognize patterns which make it illegal for us to save seeds. Because saving seeds is our highest duty. And just like Gandhi has said, nature gives it for free, we, will, we need it for our survival, we will continue to make salt. We say the same, that nature has given us these seeds, our ancestors have evolved them. We owe it to future generations to take care of the seed diversity and hand it over for the future. We will not obey laws that make it a crime. Because seed saving is not a crime, it's our ethical and ecological duty, and we will not allow corrupt corporate law come between us and the earth and the future. <laughs> so we've saved seeds of the millets, we've saved seed of rices that can grow 18 feet tall and survive a flood in the Ganges Basin. We've saved salt-tolerant rices. The genetic engineering industry keeps saying they're inventing salt tolerance. They're stealing the seeds from our farmers. And um, we've saved seeds of the dals, and we've made seed saving the basis of bringing diversity back into the food system. We've connected it to eaters. And uh, we, t we tell everyone, he says, the more you eat this, the more you save it. And people get co a bit complex. That, you know, how can you save? But the point is with life, the more you use what life gives, the more you enhance life's processes. You can literally have your cake and eat it too. Something that is not possible in a mechanical universe, but is totally possible in an ecological universe. 
Now, the, when we started seed saving, we weren't thinking of fiber. But fiber is where Monsanto first entered India. Illegally, I sued them. We stopped them from selling for four years because they didn't take any approval. But they did get approval in 2002. We used to have 1,500 cotton varieties. Now all you have is BT cotton, BT cotton, BT cotton. Most seeds were saved by farmers themselves. And the remaining seeds used to be brought by the public sector breeding. 20 varieties a year, good seed, seed that you could save, open pollinated, open source seed, and a handful of companies. When Monsanto entered, the first thing it did was start buying up the Indian seed companies and started to tie them up with um, licensing agreements. So today, 95% of all cotton seeds sold in India is sold by Monsanto. The price of seed used to be zero if it was the farmer's own seed, five rupees if the seed was bought. When Monsanto entered, they shot the price up between 3,600 rupees to 4,000 rupees. That's an 8,000% increase in prices. And the technology is supposed to control pests. The idea is you put a toxic gene into the plant, and now the plant will make its own pesticide and will control one pest family called the bollworm, and you won't have problems. But two problems with that. First, the bollworm is becoming resistant because nature evolves. And new pests are getting created every year, an attack of new pests. So farmers are having to use more pesticides, not less. And the increase from our surveys is 13 times more. That's 1,300%. So 8,000% increase in seed in one year. If you extend it to 10-year period, it's an 80,000%. Extend it to a 20-year period, it's 160,000. No, 100, yeah. 160,000, yeah. 160,000, right? Um, we are talking about a genocidal impact. And that is the impact that has been. So farmers were sold these seeds using gods, and we don't have a dearth of gods in India. 300 million divinities. So they'd pull a Hanuman, and they'd put a Lakshman, they'd pull a Guru Nanak. Wherever they were, they'd pick the favorite divinity or saint and say, you'll be a millionaire. Meantime, the companies were being told, you will not sell any seed except the part of the contract. In America, they make a farmer sign a contract. In India, they make a company sign a contract that you will not sell anything else but our seed. So there's a seed famine. I call it a seed famine. We have, of course, so what are the rates of suicides, the background note you've received? 200,000 since Monsanto entered the seed market. And it keeps growing. Of course, we've continued to use our Gandhian philosophy in intervening in this genocide and this violence. We started community seed banks in the area, and this area the, where the worst suicides are, are precisely the area where Gandhi did his spinning, Sevagram, his ashram in Sevagram in Varda. Um, we've gone there and we've started seed saving. I did a, a pilgrimage of the seed to find out why the farmers were not using their own seed, and that's when I realized that there had been a deliberate creation of a seed famine. I was just with farmers and in our seed bank, and an old variety that has been saved by a farmer has now been multiplied and is being distributed, and it is, if the average rates of BT cotton are 500 kilograms, this seed is giving 900 kilograms per acre. So it is not true at all that genetic engineering produces more. There's a very strong report from the Union of Concerned Scientists that it's titled Failure to Yield. There is no yield gain anywhere. But the industrial food system is not just creating a seed famine, it is creating a food famine. When I say a food famine, I mean a famine in terms of the soil not getting enough food. The soil doesn't need urea, 
What the soil needs is organic matter, which feeds the soil organisms that then create fertility. There's a food famine for the grower. Today, Indian farmers are committing suicide, but half of the hungry people of this world are today farmers. Because farmers are not growing food, they're growing commodities. And they're growing commodities with very high levels of debt. And the minute they grow corn as a commodity, they sell it to pay back the debt. They grow rice as a commodity, they sell it to pay back the debt, and they're not eating. And because of the economics of this whole system, where the farmer receives less and less and less, and that's also part of the corporate rule through globalization, and the prices in the market keep going up, you have a bigger and bigger profit margin. It used to be 2%, 6% in India, now it's 80% in certain food items. And that polarization is pushing the farmer deeper into hunger and into debt. But there's a food famine also for those who are having to buy more expensive food. We had a 2008 food crisis, and the food crisis has re-emerged. As I mentioned, in India it never went away, but globally it has re-emerged. And now all those companies that played with our lives in Wall Street, the financial investment companies who destroyed the housing market in this country and created the subprime crisis, those very same companies, the JP Morgans and others, are now speculating on food as a commodity. So the people who are fixing the price of food is not the farmer, is not society, is not national governments, it's speculators and gamblers. We've put food on the global casino. And of course people are going to die of starvation. Already a billion people are hungry. My guess is this year the food price rise will push another between 250 million to 500 million people to hunger who are just barely making it but will not be able to buy enough food if the food prices keep increasing. So we have to reclaim our food. And food, of course, is the web of life. We have a beautiful Upanishad in India that says, everything is food, everything is something else is food. And it's so true, we forget it. When we think of man's empire, of na empire over nature, got man on top, uh, everything else below. It should be a cycle, you know. We do cremation, you do burials. But what happens, you know, in a burial? Whose feast is it? All the soil microorganisms that eat the human. So it isn't that we are on top of the universe. We are one in the web of life. And food is the web of life. That is why, for me, the most radical actions of our times are like the spinning wheel of Gandhi. They're small but they're small in a strategic way that start to change the balance of power between corporations and citizens. They bring back power and democracy in the hands of citizens. We organize our search for freedom around five fundamental freedoms. The freedom of the seed, and for us when we say freedom of the seed, we don't just mean the farmer's freedom to have seed, we mean the seed's freedom to evolve on its own integrity, to not be poisoned with BT poison, to not be patented, to not have its scrambling of its genomic structure. Seed freedom, food freedom, which, and we always talk of freedom as sovereignty, so seed sovereignty, seed freedom, food sovereignty, food freedom, land sovereignty, land freedom, water sovereignty, water freedom, and forest sovereignty and forest freedom. Because in every one of these areas, these gifts of nature are being appropriated as the private property of corporations who turn it into a commodity and take our commons, that which belongs to all of us, and sell it back to us at a high price. They have reduced life to a market. And as we started when we stopped WTO in Seattle, our slogan was, our world is not for sale. We will defend our commons. We will keep protecting both nature and our rights to nature's gifts. And as far as nature is concerned, she does not discriminate. 
She does not discriminate between the human being and the non-human animal. She does not discriminate between the poor and the rich. And as Gandhi put it so powerfully, this earth has enough for everyone's needs, but it does not have enough for a few people's greed. Greed has become a poison for this planet. Greed is threatening life so severely that within a century we could see our own annihilation as human being. And that's why we have to take up the courage, the power, the imagination to deal with the rule of corporations who only know how to deal with greed and bring back our economies of democracies and embed them in an earth democracy. That's why I talk of living democracies, living economies, and living cultures in place of the killing democracy, killing economy, and killing cultures that corporate rule and globalization has given us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, stimulate the first question, if I may, because I was very stimulated by your, your talk. Uh, I'm also concerned about the use of words in an accurate way. I would like to use the word fascism and see what you have to say about it. I mean, as we teach, uh, as I teach, uh, political ideologies, among other things, uh, the, cor the idea of the corporate state, or a state organized like a corporation, or a a uh, corporation growing to have the power of a state is the classic definition of fascism. In your opinion, would you see the corporatization uh, that is part of globalization as really being appropriately described as a growing global fascism? I have used that term. I have talked about the emergence of food fascism. Thank Just you. <laughs> Please, uh, begin. Identify yourself, perhaps, and if it's on, you have to push it so it has a green light. You see it? Red light, but yes. Ah, good. Identify yourself, ask a quick question, and we'll move along. Hello, Shiva. Name is Aaron. I had a quick question about what the current structure of control over the food market is in the world, if you know any details about that that you mentioned. Yeah, well, I mentioned that the Control of the food market is out of control. Okay. In the sense, just like in the subprime crisis and when Wall Street came down, nobody really knew who's doing what. Yeah. Uh, by, the, by the destruction of the difference between banks where people put their savings and investment firms and the merging of the two in this country, um, by removal of the act which was called? Right. Um, What's basically happened, hap what has happened is, there's really a free play out there. Unaccountable, nobody's keeping track, and nobody really knows. Which is why it was such chaos. Now those same chaotic phenomena have entered, but those who invest are making huge money. The difference between food and housing is this. If you can't pay me your mortgage, you just leave your house. But for food, you have to keep eating, and you'll keep borrowing. And that's where the guarantee that these companies are seeking. Let me just read out an ad for you from these investment firms. It's, it's criminal, if you ask me. It says, do you enjoy rising prices? This is asking people to invest. Everybody talks about commodities with the Agriculture Euro Fund. You can benefit from the increasing in the value of the seven most important agricultural commodities. So those who are profiteering from the speculation, of course, are doing very well. Cargill has gone on record. And I would recommend to you read an article in Harper's called The Food Bubble. I think it's 2010 sometime, where this journalist realized that all this investment was moving into food. And in that article, there's a quotation where Cargill says, our profits have increased 
because of speculation. So the speculators are doing well, Cargill is doing very well, but everyone else is doing very badly because they're spending more on a vital need. So essentially anybody could we and we don't know and we need to find out? <laughs> we need to find out and I think one of the, if, if you were to ask me, I think revoking that... Um, the, the charter? No, a a charter of course, that would be the best. But you know that separation that gamblers should not be allowed to play with our money. <laughs> um, that was the separation. And that's necessary so that pension funds and others don't get used against us. You know, you work all your life, put your money into a pension fund, then it's taken on and bundled by investors, and they work to work against you with their investment strategy. So I think basically it's about reclaiming democracy and accountability, which is why the Tea Party is totally wrong. If you didn't, it's, the problem is we have no regulation. Exactly. We need regulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Vandana. My name is JC. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, my roommates and I are going to be growing a garden this season. We're starting in actually a couple of days. Um, I'm curious because I did watch a documentary. Of, um, I think it was Food Inc. Uh, how they were saying that it is actually illegal to have seed that isn't, you know, owned or operated by Monsanto, and I don't care about breaking that law. So I would like to know where to find seed that isn't tainted like that. Where, where would you find that? Well, there are now lots and lots of uh, local groups that are doing seed saving. I probably, in my bag, have a gift that was given to me yesterday. Cool. Some seeds mm -hmm. by a woman who's doing seed saving. Mm -hmm. I can pass on her contact to you. Okay. You get in touch with her. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. Shiva. Thank you so much for coming and bringing your wisdom. I really appreciate it. Um, my concern is that um, a basic issue, like you mentioned in India, being around textile and salt, that people were able to take that back. And one of the two main issues I see in the United States is sovereignty around food and water and how all of that comes through a system, whether it's the grocery store or a pipe, and that where, what is the path to gaining that sovereignty for ourselves? Well, I think the first path is much more intimate direct links. So for example, buying directly from a farmer, farmer. creating urban gardens so that a community can have its food, farmers markets, those mm -hmm. are all places for reclaiming food sovereignty. In terms of water, of course, if you have your own well, nothing like it, but if you live in a city and you depend on a municipality to ensure that your town water stays in public hands and is not privatized, and the defense of the public spaces and the public goods and the commons, in my view, is going to be the terrain for shaping democracy and earth democracy in the future. That's why what's happening in Wisconsin is so important for the future of this country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm actually a Portland State student whose uh, focus is on resource management. Um, and I know, I realize Monsanto's harms go so much deeper than just the seeds. I mean, they, they've modified their plants to be uh, resilient to Roundup, which is a product that they also make so that you can use more Roundup on your crops. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than buying locally with the farmers, when it comes to a political aspect and getting your voice heard, you know, I've been writing the letters to the White House each time that another GMO goes up to, to, to pass or something, but what do you feel be the most effective way for us to pool our resources and actually make a change against this type of corporation setup? Well, as far as Monsanto's concerned, I think the two bigger, more sort of more political responses, besides saving non-GM seeds, growing mm -hmm. non-GM food, is creating GMO-free regions. It's the strategy we've used in India. It's a strategy used very, very effectively and strongly in Europe. There are 50 governments, of which I work with about five of them. Mm -hmm who have said we'll never use GM seeds, and they've declared themselves GMO-free. They've told the national government, we won't obey you. It's like a satyagraha. And they've told the European Commission, which 
Monsanto has 80 lobbyists sitting in Brussels to influence European Commission decisions. So every time there's a push, these GMO-free reasons rise, and the European Commission has to step back. I also think we need to very directly target Monsanto itself, because it has become, in my view, the company that is having the longest term impact in terms of yeah. damaging the evolution of life on this planet. There's been uh, research recently released that the Roundup, that's, whose use increases because of Roundup ready crops, is causing abortions mm -hmm. in animals and therefore could be in humans. But also, very important Argentinian study where they spray Roundup all over the country because the whole country is now Roundup resistant soil, that children are being born with birth defects. So we are talking not just of the plants, but also the humans and other species being seriously affected. So I'm going to start a campaign this, um, hopefully by May or June. We are consolidating all the experience in every part of the world, what the Argentinians have been through. They're writing the Argentina chapter. What the Mexicans have suffered in terms of corn. What the Africans have had to suffer. We are covering the failure, the risks, as well as the corruption of government and decision making. Of course, the United States will have a chapter. India will have a chapter. And everywhere, you have a record of genetic contamination, political contamination of our governments, stealing our governments from us, and knowledge contamination by polluting science itself and selling lies in the name yes. of science. Yes. So, when we have this report ready, we are going to call for a disinvestment and a boycott. Yeah. Now, Gandhi started with a boycott of British clothing because when you want to defend your own democracy, you also have to resist that which colonizes you. And in this case, Monsanto is the colonizer. So you have to say, don't put your money into it. And for farmers to say, have a boycott, but for that, we'll have to build up very rapidly alternative seed supply systems. We'll have to bring up, bring back the local seed firms. We'll have to bring back seed, community seed banks, etc. But I think, I think if we name it, it's like a bit like the emperor has no clothes. I think that should be the title of the report. The emperor has no clothes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two things. It looks like we now have two lines. And we might be forced to take turns if we're civilized people. Okay. Second, if you're, a question, if you're asking a question, you need to be within about one inch of the microphone or others might not be able to hear you. So you have to be right up like I am here. I think it's the turn of this line. I think so too. To ask a question. Please, identify yourself and ask your question. Hi there, my name is Colin, um, and I'm currently in a social justice community theater group that uses theater to the oppressed to talk about issues in the community. And focusing on the intersections of racism and sexism and all, all these sort of social justice issues, um, I'm finding that a lot of people have trouble bringing it around to food equity, and I, I've not found the words to describe how, um, to, to, to describe the intersections of racism and sexism and sort of the, the global food economy, and I was wondering if you could help me with that. Read my book, Staying Alive. I have. <laughs> you have. So you know, the new edition has an entire updated chapter, because I wrote it before globalization, mm -hmm. but it has an updated chapter on the food issue. Yeah. And it definitely sort of addresses that interaction between you know, racism and sexism, yeah. and how, how these two distorted worldviews impact what, what our relationship to food is. And of course, I go one step further to say, if we have to have a future of food, we've got to turn to the peasants of the South, and we have to turn to women. That's where we know what food, growing food sustainably is like. Even today, 70% of the food is produced by the small farms of the third world, not by Cargill. Thank you. 
Um, my name is Liz, and I'm a Portland State University student. And um, I've noticed that here in America, there seems to be a silent war on a type of knowledge, which to me is cooking. And cooking, the basics, is the soul of a home, in my opinion. And it seems like the more corporations want to move us in the direction of accepting genetically modified seeds and accepting genetically modified animals and buying into their propaganda-led campaigns, um, the more I find it, people accept it. And there's, it, it's kind of hard to get people to understand these ideals and to reclaim these values. And I don't know, do you see this a lot also in the countries that you visit and in your home that um, there's that secret eradication of knowledge and how to cook mm -hmm. as well? Well, actually, there's such an irony because while there's an attack on cooking, which is power of the ordinary person, there is an explosion of cooking programs on TV <laughs> and an explosion of fancy cookbooks on, in bookstores. Um, I've faced this very directly because there's an assault directly on women's cooking and the corporations are very clever and this is related to the question that just came before where they're making it look like cooking is women's enslavement and as if they are here to liberate us. And I had this debate at the World Economic Forum with McKinsey which had report, written a report whose acronym is FIDA which means profit. And then they go on to say people shouldn't be cooking. And, uh, and the head of McKinsey actually tried to say, you are trying to keep women in the kitchen. I said, no, we are trying to keep our food in the kitchen. And we would like men and women to share the cooking. Yes. Exactly. And you are not our liberators. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe I should just add, because I've just so your, your mother was a grandmother. There's also an assault in ads on grandmothers. You know, there's an old, older woman who'll bring a dish to a child, who'll push it away and sulk till the mother brings a Maggi noodles or a pizza or, you know, the typical things they want to push on the Indians. And so we've started something we call the Grandmother's University. Because they're putting grandmothers down and we want to celebrate grandmothers' wisdom, knowledge, skills, and they love. Yeah. <laughs> I am, my name's Annie, and um, it's a great privilege to be here today um, to hear you talk. I'm a little nervous. Um, my question goes along the lines of what the prior questions were um, about women and gender, and, and you being a um, very highly um, looked at um, uh, environmentalists or a person who speaks out for, and you are of a different race and color say than the white generation and you're female. Being a female, was it, did you find a lot of um, miles or s steps against you? Was it harder for you, do you think, than in a, is it a male dominated world when it comes to uh, <laughs> yeah. environmental? Well, you know, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's easier because you're a woman. And you know, they, they get so taken by surprise. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello, my name's Kim Smith, and I teach sociology at Sylvania. And I'll be hosting you later. Um, I'm curious about, well, I specialize in social movements. And I'm curious about how to stand up to corporations without the fear of them oppressing us in terms of safety and lawsuits and death threats and those kinds of things. Like how in your reality, I know you have to face those kinds of things and I'm wondering for all of us too, like how do you find the strength to know that they are trying to not just repress us through our food but also through our safety when, as activists? Yeah, I, I think you know, that's why the concept of Satyagraha is so important. Because what is Satyagraha? You work from your truth. And that is what is your ground, and that is what's your power. That's what gives you the strength. And it also creates fearlessness. 
Because if the right thing to do is defined by truth that you experience, and when I say truth, I'm not meaning it in some abstract form. I'm talking of truth in a lived reality of interconnections with duties, responsibilities, rights, all fully uh, experienced. The, that's really the counter. That's the strength. If you first start thinking about the corporation and becoming afraid of it, then you'll never act. So Satyagraha really is centering yourself in yourself and your community and the earth and acting from there. Now, any abusive power, any violent form of power will, of course, try violence. It only works for a short time. Threats only work for a short time. Mm -hmm. Because if what you're acting on is the right thing, then your next neighbor, your next person, your next person will multiply. I mean, I started this 87, as I mentioned. 87, nobody cared about what's happening to seed. Nobody knew that it's under danger. But each of you is today concerned. Mm -hmm. So it grows, you know. The communication spread. When Gandhi went to Dandi, he went alone. But people followed him and others joined. And then across the country, action spread. So just think of Tahrir Square, Egypt. Think of Tunisia, that first man that triggered what has become an uncontrollable phenomena. But didn't come from someone saying, I'm going to be a leader. And I will lead the masses. It came from someone saying, this is the right thing to do. And because it's the right thing to do, it resonates and others join. So I think get, overcoming the fear of the corporations, I'll mention just a little bit. You know, when I first started to come and talk about the GM question in this country, people would say, we can't. We can't organize a conference. Monsanto will sue us. We can't write a book. I, I'd say document it. So we've written it. And our publisher was sued. We made a film, we were sued. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? Is come to St. Louis. Let's organize a conference. And we did a conference called Biodevastation. And I think it must have been 2002 or something. And I said, we'll come there, we'll be international, we'll be from all over the world, and say the same things, and let's see how Monsanto goes after 70 countries. Mm. Yeah? They hid behind the bushes. And from then onwards, biodevastation has been an annual conference. It's been possible for people to write about Monsanto. I give speeches about Monsanto. They sometimes hide at the back, but that's about the worst they can do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is, you know, I give a little background to the question maybe is, now that we're in technology, you know, we've, we've come into technology from the natural world. Man has progressed the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, capitalism, you know, maybe I'm not sure what's next. <laughs> but um, can the synthetic world have a sustainable relationship with the natural world? The synthetic world, given that it constantly must expand its greed, cannot have a relationship with the natural world. Let me just mention, the same industries that first grabbed our food are now grabbing food for biofuel. 30% yeah? of your food is now, of corn is going into making oil for cars. And the imagination, if you read the literature, the imagination of the corporations, which are five in oil, five in agribusiness, five in seed, five in water, five in forest, they're all converging into one. And they want to control all the biological systems of the planet to create a synthetic world. Not only will the natural world not survive, the synthetic world won't survive right. with that kind of predatory appetite. Right. Can, I, can I take that further, maybe? It depends on the moderator who's missing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'm right here, I think. Um, Follow up one, but we need to move along with okay, other sure, sure. speakers. Um, I guess the, then the question is more specifically then um, closed loop industries where there's no off gassing in yeah. the process, 
um, you know, like plastics that are a closed loop yeah. industry, that, that would be a form of synthetic that, that uh, mimics nature. Yeah. Um, but it, the point is, normally when we talk about synthetic, it means sucks up natural resources and throws out waste. So the minute it's closed loop, it's this way. And you know, when you frame the question, you've said we've left nature for technology. I think part of what corporate rule has done is created a very alienated understanding of technology. Technology is merely tools. Right. The stone man, uh, the stone age man had tools. He had technology. That's, yeah. Human beings have technology. Right. Every stage, all the time. The point is, not only is it bigger and more powerful, like, Often they'd say, oh, you know, genetic engineering is a more sophisticated technology. And I say it's the equivalent of bringing in a JCB machine to put up one of those paintings. Yeah. For that painting, all you need is a nail and some kind of hammer that puts in the nail. It's the most effective way to put a painting up. You don't bring a JCB machine. They're bringing JCB machines to deal with life and seeds. Not smart, it's crude. Right. So I don't talk of it as high tech, I talk of it as crude tech. Right. No. Thank, thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Shiva. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am a graduate of Portland State University, which is close to here in um, conflict resolution. There's a master's program there. And um, we'll hope that maybe one of these days you'll speak at our university too. Um, my question, actually, I am really glad that you're speaking about Monsanto because um, as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of different images in the media, and I'm sure that you have a lot to say about um, image manipulation um, as far as advertising. Uh, I, I, I even think that Monsanto actually sponsors shows on PBS, including the News Hour, and then it, it proje projects itself as being this um, very altruistic corporation that's trying to to grow this rice that gets like a double um, uh, fold uh, crop, for example, for the starving people in Africa. Um, so I was wondering, um, with the world food shortage as something as a problem, although a lot of that, the reason why the food that doesn't get to those people is because of corrupt governments there. Um, and if you wanted to talk about that too within the question, but how would you um, say that if there's anything that we can do uh, for taking down and dismantling the incorrect images that Monsanto's trying to put out there in the world when we talk about um, what Ma Monsanto's doing as far as um, preventing farmers from keeping their own seeds? Well, for one, as I mentioned already earlier, there is no single seed that has Monsanto has sold that's genetically engin engineered that has higher yields because of the genetic engineering. It's technologically not possible, and empirically, it's not there. So one of the first steps is to counter it. You know, there is a group called Ad Busters that takes ads and writes sort of, you know, adds a little bit to it. And I think one of you can take this up as a project. Take the ads of Monsanto and make counter ads that are the reality of whatever. They'll talk about how BT cotton made Indian farmers millionaires. They've even sponsored studies, 250 million a year. They've done another study how BT cotton is liberating Indian women. Uh, for each of them, there's a reality which needs to be put into communication. And you know, I mean, that's exactly what young people love to do. And I'm sure someone here will find a way to, uh, to create more authentic communication. Adbusters, thank you. I might want to add that uh, given we have six minutes, probably the three people who have just been standing for some time will be our last questioners. Um, if you'd like, you can go and then we'll take turns. If you want to go. I want to go first, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Larry Davis. I'm a student here at PCC. I want to say thank you for everything you do and for coming and speaking. Um, have you noticed a movement more spread, not only in this country, but others, where they're trying to prohibit private and community gardens. There, there's been speak lately of, of trying to ban, you know, a person of having a garden in their, their own yard. Well, they definitely try, but it depends on how strong the movement for reclaiming 
gardening as a human freedom is. So there's, it's not going to be easy because the, I'm, I remember in Lewis and Clark, they were tearing up the, the parking lots to create gardens. So there was a period where concrete was the celebration. Right. But I think people's consciousness is growing so much that, and especially at the local level, it's not going to be easy. Because gardens grow locally, locally usually, local authorities give space, a, you know, partner. It's, that's where the spaces get expanded. So if it happens, people should rise and defend their freedom and do a garden satyagraha. <laughs> Thank you. Greetings, Dr. Shiva. Thanks for being here. Uh, two of the most powerful social movements in the world are the labor movement and the environmental movement. And some people have talked about a tension between these two movements. Um, can you talk a little bit about that tension and about what role you think workers play uh, in the environmental movement? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate to have been part of movements in India where, for example, the women of Chipko were workers. They were growing food. They were working on their land. And they were all also the protectors of the forest. So we haven't had this artificial divide that has been more easy for corporations to promote for a divide and rule policy in industrialized society. I think there are two places where we need a new convergence between the ecological movement and the workers' movement. The first is by redefining what is called productivity. You know, when the technology question was asked, how is food efficiency defined in agriculture? It's defined by putting humans as the only input, not natural resources. Because productivity is output per unit input. You should calculate all outputs and all inputs. Inputs include the water, they include the finance, they include the soil, they include the biodiversity. Outputs actually include biodiversity, water, food, nutrition. By pitting nature against humans in the very definition, of productivity, industrial society, industrial agriculture has created this antithetical relationship. And we are at a time where we are running out of resources, we are not running out of people. So we need to shift productivity with respect to natural resources rather than labor. So these very fundamental conceptual issues of what's a good technology, what is growth, what is productivity, etc. And the second, has to be, in my view, a place where we converge on the public good and commons. You know, the environmental movement needs to become a defense of our living commons. But the workers' movement also is about defending our common good, including the right to work, to the dignity of work, because not only is the way the system has been designed by corporations, destroying nature and becoming life-threatening, it is creating the end of work. And it's, on the one hand, putting all of nature into the market and a commodity, so you buy your water, you buy your food, you buy, your, you buy everything. You buy your education, you buy your health. And meantime, it's taking away from people the capacity to work, to earn, to be able to fit. So it's a contradiction. And we need to address that contradiction in the system by new partnerships of how can we create, how can we defend work, that's the Wisconsin issue, the right to work, the right to organize, and how can we create new opportunities for work which also are sustainable. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Will. I'm a student here at PCC, and I'm doing a project on religious inequalities. And one of the things I've been looking at a lot is that Abrahamic religions have been kind of ignoring a lot of the devastation caused by it. Is there a real huge inequality of the Abrahamic kind of like ignoring everything while the other rest of the world is kind of looking at it as a problem? 
Well, you're asking the wrong person. You know, I'm not so educated on religions. What I try and do is every time there's religious divide, I try and look for what's common behind them. So for example, last year we did a, a major gathering on faith and food, showing when it comes to the bottom line, every religion says, grow good food in abundance, and every religion says, share with your neighbor that nobody go hungry. So that's my height of religious education. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before we wrap things up, I think, and give Vandana Shiva a final round of applause, um, a couple of announcements should be made. Um, I would like to yield just two minutes, go slightly, slightly over time, to a young man who would like to inform you regarding organizations that you may be involved in or become involved in in the Portland and uh, Oregon area. Yes? Briefly. Hi, I just had a couple of things to say. First of all, thank you so much for your speech and for all your work over the years. Uh, to many people, as you know, you're a great hero. And uh, there's a wonderful movie, um, uh, Helena Norberg Hodge, I don't know if some of you know her, she made a movie called The Economics of Happiness that uh, uh, Vandana Shiva is in. Uh, she has a wonderful role there, a very important movie to see. So uh, Helena Norberg Hodge will be coming back uh, sometime in June. Um, so I hope you can all see that or find another way to see it. There's an organization called uh, Food and Water Watch, a natural organization. I hope some of you have heard of them. But they're uh, fighting many campaigns very apropos to this talk. So uh, Nestle is trying to um, get rights to uh, water in the Columbia Gorge and start a, a bottling plant. So that needs a lot of opposition. And uh, they're, they're spearheading campaigns uh, to write to uh, Obama to try to do something about all the approvals of Monsanto recently. The government approved GE alfalfa and uh, GE sugar beets and a bunch of other things. So there's lots of great organizations, Food and Water Watch particularly, to get involved in a lot of great things to, to do. So thank you so much. At this point, please join me in saying thank you, thank you, thank you for being here.